OK. If you go to the GitHub repo linked in the description of the video, you will see the README like this. Uh, gives you some instructions on what kind of setup you have to do. Um, and then we can go ahead and get started by using the processor that I wrote up. Uh, let's go ahead and run through one of these examples like the one shown here. So what this is going to do This is going to show all the closed solutions for the Rubik's Mini 12 pieces. Uh, it's going to remove the reverse symmetries, it's going to remove the chiral symmetries, and it's going to list the results. Uh, so this actually takes a little while to run. I'm not going to let it run forever, but you can see that it outputs some results. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this solution, just to show some things we can do with it. Uh, if we want to check that a solution is valid, we can just do something like this. Now it generated that previous solution for us, so we know it should be true. Um, now if you, let's say we have a, a snake and we did if you imagine that in your head, you do three right turns in a row, that's going to intersect itself. So it says false. Anyways, you can play around with kind of what this little program does. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have, show how we can use it to generate some code. This, this is all in the readme, if you want to look at the readme. Anyways, it outputs some code here and put it on the clipboard. Uh, I'm going to pop open open scan. Put that in. Run it. We get a nice little shape like this. Uh, we can add some animation. If you go and learn how to use open scan, this dollar t is just a special variable that's used by the animation. It goes from 0 to 1. Um, and it's going to generate this many frames for us. It's going to try to draw it at, let's say, 30 frames per second. And there we go. Now, if I were to save this file to disk and then check this checkbox, this dump pictures, uh, it would start, it would write out a bunch of frame files. Um, and then you could take those frames and you could use something like FFmpeg to actually generate a video from it. Anyways, that's pretty much it as far as the demo goes. If you would like to see the code, I'll show it at the end of the video. In this part of the video, we're going to show how you can represent a Rubik snake and how you can use this representation to enumerate all of the solutions. Uh, I'm also going to show you how to make animations like this. Uh, so first we need some kind of system to represent objects like the one shown on the right. We can do this by assigning a number to each of the interfaces between all of the prisms. Uh, which will tell us how to twist them relative to one another. Uh, in this example, we have a 24-piece Rubik's snake. That's the original. Uh, and so there are 23 different interfaces between all the prisms. Uh, we'll, we'll show some better examples further along. That'll make that a little more clear. Uh, we are going to use a right-hand rule to do the twists on our pieces. So when we're working with the next prism, uh, each of those numeric rules is going to tell us the number of 90 degree turns uh, to rotate that piece. Imagine pointing your thumb in the direction of the next piece and then rotating in the direction that your hand is pointing. Like here, rule zero, no rotation is done. 
rotate once along the curve, the direction your hand is going, twice, 180 degrees, 270. Rule three. All right, so here we have a three-piece snake that's represented by two rules, two zeros. The idea of this rule system is that a string of zeros is going to give a snake that is just un unfolded in a straight line. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pretend the next rule is a two. And you can see our piece has been rotated twice. Let's go ahead and add a couple more zeros. Um, now let's pretend the next rule is going to be a three. I want you to imagine your thumb sticking out of that leading face, the one that you can see that's exposed, and rotating the imaginary piece one, two, three times along the direction your fingers are curling. You should get this. Uh, if you need to, imagine, just pause the video and try to visualize this in your head. Um, now let's apply another three. Stick your thumb into the screen your right thumb into the screen, the direction that the open face is facing away from you. And imagine another piece there that's not rotated and rotate it three times 90 degrees. You should get this. Uh, let's pretend the next rule is going to be a one. So your right thumb should stick to the left out of that open face and rotate a piece once. So now it's facing down. Uh, the Rubik's mini snake has 12 pieces. So just for completion, I'm just going to go ahead and add two more zeros. Uh, so now that we have a way of representing our snake, uh, let's talk a little bit about the combinatorics of how you can enumerate through all of the possible solutions. This is a Rubik's mini snake. It has 12 pieces and 11 interfaces between those pieces. Each interface can be rotated in one of four ways, giving us an upper bound of 4 to the 11 possible solutions for this snake. Of course, that does not take into account any symmetries that might be present uh, or whether or not the solution is even physically realizable, but we'll, we'll deal with that later in the video. Another symmetry we have is by starting at the opposite end of the snake. So if we take a straightened out snake and we flip it around and we apply the same sequence of rules, we'll effectively get the same snake. Um, and we can represent that in the rules by flipping the order that the rules are applied. To review, we have chiral symmetry where swapping the ones with the threes in a sequence of rules produces two snakes, which are a mirror image of one another. And we have reverse symmetry where starting from the opposite end of the snake, applying the same rules, or starting from the same end of the snake and applying the rules in reverse order produces a similar looking solution. Once we start talking about snakes that are closed solutions, that is where the ends meet up with one another, uh, we'll have to deal with cyclic symmetry. More on that coming up next. Uh, you might also be wondering if there are any rotational symmetries, uh, but remember the way that the way that we're representing the rules only talks about how the pieces are oriented relative to one another. It doesn't say anything about the absolute orientation of the pieces in space. So we, we don't really need to worry about any rotational symmetry besides the reverse symmetry. Here's an example of what I mean by closed solution. The two ends meet forming a loop. My goal when I was starting this project was to find all of the closed solutions of the Rubik's mini snake which is what I'm showing you how to do in this video. So when we're talking about cyclic symmetry, I'm talking about where the position of the first and last piece are along the loop. Uh, here you can imagine that the red piece is the last piece and the green piece is the first piece. There is an open interface between the red and the green piece and it is not shown in the rule set because the rules only show 11 interfaces where there's kind of like an implicit 12th join where those face where those two ends meet. Uh, you can see that if I move the position of the first and the last piece, the loop looks essentially identical, but the rules that form it are different. Uh, you can see a kind of a couple of different examples moving along here. Uh, all these solutions that I'm showing have different rule sets, but I'm calling them equivalent under cyclic symmetry. 
Let's go ahead and use this example to show how we can generate all of the solutions that have cyclic symmetry with one another. Say we're starting with the solution as shown. And let's say we have a second one that is similar, except the position of the first piece has been moved forward one. Uh, you might have noticed that you can simply generate a cyclically equivalent solution for a closed snake by just shifting the rules forward or backwards some number of times like this. Uh, there is one minor problem. Notice how the first rule from the first solution doesn't quite wrap around to the last rule in the second solution. So what's going on here? Look at where the 3 is in that first solution. It's where the first interface is after that first piece. But in the second solution, it has been rotated out so that it's where the first and the last piece join, so it, it disappears. It doesn't just wrap around to the back. The one that's in the back is this zero here. So in the first solution, that zero isn't present because it's where the first and the last piece join, but in the second solution, it is now where that last interface is. Uh, one way you can resolve this is simply by imagining that the interface between the first and last piece is part of our rule set as an implicit last rule. Um, now the two rules just wrap around one another like you would expect. Okay, so now that we know what symmetries we might have to deal with, how can we enumerate all the possible solutions? Uh, we can just walk through them in numerical order. And if you prefer, you can imagine this as if you're just counting up in base 4. Now all we have to do is be sure to not waste work checking symmetric solutions. What you can do is take a solution, look at its reverse symmetry, and then look at all the chiral symmetries. We can like, normalize our representation of state by only bothering with the minimum one of these. When you are enumerating through all the possible states, you can skip the ones which aren't normalized. So when I was doing this, I chose to wait until I'd found all the solutions before checking for cyclic duplicates. Imagine if you included cyclic symmetry when you were doing this normalization of the states. When you rotate the rule sequence to generate all the cyclic duplicates, how do you know what the implicit state is? The answer is that, unlike the reverse and chiral symmetries, you actually have to compute the geometry of the snake. It's not just a simple, it's not just a simple manipulation of the rule sequence. Speaking of geometry, let's move on to talking about how we can actually check if a solution is physically realizable. That way we can eliminate ones that aren't like the one shown here. So this is a nasty little diagram that I made to help me visualize all of the orientations of a prism in space and all the transformations between each prism. Uh, let's go ahead and break down this diagram because there's, there's quite a lot going on here. Don't worry about it too much. This image simply shows all the orientations that a prism can be in. Uh, I'm imagining that we have some kind of XYZ Cartesian grid that we're placing all the prisms in. The upper left cube is just showing what direction each axis points. The one circle in pink is the orientation I decided to choose for the first prism in every snake we work with. The first prism will be fixed to this orientation, that way we don't have to worry about dealing with any rotational symmetry. You'll see that each prism has a leading face and an inner face. What I mean by leading face is simply the face where the next prism in the sequence is going to be placed, and the inner face is the face where the previous prism was placed. In the case of the first prism, the inner face is simply the special open facet, and the leading face is where the first twist will actually be performed. That is, where the first rule will be applied. Likewise, on the last prism of the snake, the inner face is where the last twist is applied, and the leading face will just be an open face. If the snake is made to be a closed loop, the leading face of the last prism will meet the inner face of the first prism. I've gone ahead and named each of these orientations as a pair of leading and inner face, showing which axis that face points towards. For example, the prism circled in pink has a leading face that points forward in the x direction, and the interface points down in the y direction, hence plus x minus y. Hopefully that made at least a little bit of sense. This diagram is showing how the rules 0 through 3 work. Let's see, we're currently working with the pieces shown on the left 
and we want to apply one of the rules that are labeled above the arrows. You can see how by using the right hand rule your thumb sticks through the inner face of the current piece that is out of the leading face of the previous piece. The, the current interface meets the previous leading face. That, that's the idea of what these interface and leading face are. Anyways, now we have to somehow figure out how each of these four rules applies to each of the 12 different orientations. You could just brute force in and work out all 48 combinations by hand, but there are a couple of shortcuts we can take. For example, notice that the direction of the interface does not change, only the leading face. In the example showed here, all the rules still result in the current interface pointing in the minus y direction. So I went ahead and worked out how all of these rotations work and boiled it down to this. The left column shows what the working interface is, and the right columns show the order in which the leading face progresses by applying the rules 0 through 3. For example, let's say that the current piece we are rotating has orientation plus z plus y. And let's say we want to apply the rule 3. Then we simply move forward in the corresponding cycle 1, 2, 3 times, and now we have the new leading face. So our new orientation is going to be minus x plus y. This part of the diagram is showing how to get the orientation of the next piece from the previous piece. Even when no rule is applied, or if you prefer to think like it as rule 0 being applied, the piece still has to rotate 180 degrees. Uh, let's say we have this cube here. If we swap and negate the leading and interfaces of the previous piece, we'll get a 180 degree rotation. After that, you can use the rules from the previous slide to determine the actual new leading face. We also need to determine the coordinates of the next piece. So if we take the coordinates of the current piece, we look at where the leading face is pointing, and we add one to that coordinate, we will get the new coordinates for the next piece. So in the example on the right, you can see that its x-coordinate is 4, and its leading face is pointing in the minus x direction. So we subtract 1 from the x-coordinate, and we get 3, 2, 3 for the next piece. Putting all of this together, we can get a set of rules that determine how to position and orient our next piece in space. Uh, you can take a look at this and take a look at the code later if you want to actually walk through it. The last thing we have to do is determine whether or not there is a collision between any two pieces which occupy the same coordinates. The only caveat here is that it doesn't really matter what the order of the leading and interfaces are when we're checking for collisions. As long as no two faces point along the same axis, then there is no collision. Hopefully that last section wasn't too dense, uh, but at least it's there for your reference. All that's left to do is code up a solver and show you how to draw and animate the solutions. So here we have some of the Python. Um, this function here is if you actually pass in a state, like one of those, like one of these strings. Um, oh, that's not it. Like if we pressed one of these into this function, it'll tell us whether or not it's physical. Uh, I've tried capturing as best as I could uh, all those diagrams that we showed in the previous section in code here. Uh, this checks, so the way I'm representing a prism, is I've got a tuple, uh, let's see, like this. If you remember, we were talking about leading face and interface. Uh, and then we just have some of the cycle logic showing how the rotations progress. Um, got some of the logic here that actually does the rotations. Um, just there, there's a lot going on here. You can go read through it yourself if you really want to try uh, going through it. Um, uh, one note that I will make is if you want to try uh, doing all of this by yourself, there's a lot of opportunities to really make this uh, more efficient. Let me let me show you an example. Uh, so this enumerate states, if we pass in an n, say like 11 for the Rubik's Mini, 
uh, it's going to try to uh, recursively go through every possible state and try to figure out whether or not it's a solution. Uh, one of the problems is if you look at uh, how the recursion is working here, I'm not actually like backing out at all when a failure happens. So like let's say we have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, one, two, three. Let's say we had a state that looks like this. Uh, if we were using that is physical method and we were processing each rule one at a time, um, you would notice that once you got to this spot, right after this, uh, you don't really need to check every solution that comes after it. In this case, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's there's two to the seven, um, or sorry, four to the seven, two to the 14. So there's like 8,192 solutions that you're really wasting your time checking if you've already determined that this first one is valid when you got to this point. So so uh, you really want to implement a recursive backtracker, um, but we're not we're not doing any backtracking logic in here. Um, and if you wanted to uh, try to use this to, let's say, find all the solutions of the uh, Rubik's original snake, the one where we have 24 pieces, uh, you're not really going to be able to do that with this program. This this physical function, all of this branching here isn't really necessary. Um, so if you wanted to, you could probably write this using the GPU. Uh, so let's say you wanted to write a compute shader, you could probably write a compute shader and do it much more quickly. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's really only one person who's ever actually tried iterating through um, all of the Rubik's original snake solutions and they got an answer. It, it took them about like five months to get to that answer and it was a few trillion solutions. If you imagine, right, that's like four to the 23, two to the uh, to the 46 solutions. So about two to the six trillion. If you want to think of it like that, two to the six trillion solutions or, you know, possible possible states that you'd have to loop over. Uh, far fewer of them than that are actually physical, and then they also did the symmetries. But anyways, you can't use this program to do that. It's not performant enough. But there are certainly things you can do to make it performant. And I'm sure the people who computed this would be very happy to know that um, someone has actually confirmed their results. Anyways, uh, that's really all about I have for you. Um, Go ahead, go play around with this. Go have some fun with it. I think there's a lot of cool stuff you can do.